Welcome to Roadcase, the podcast that explores the live music experience. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Josh Rosenberg, and I'll be taking you on a journey through in-depth interviews with performers and key people in the industry to explore the magic of live music, how it can be totally transformative for both fans and performers, and we'll look at how they take it all out on the road. It's going to be a great ride, so here we go. Welcome back to Roadcase. This is Josh Rosenberg. Thanks for joining me. Super psyched to be here. We've got a lot of great episodes coming up, and this one is no exception. Um, I really encourage everyone to get involved with Roadcase. We love email. I'd love to hear from you. Send me your opinions, comments, uh, suggestions for guests, or just say hi. Our email is info at Roadcase Pod, or you can talk to us through the socials on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. We're at Roadcase Pod. And of course, you can um, support this podcast on Patreon. If you'd like to become a Patreon subscriber, you can do that at patreon.com slash Roadcase Pod. We'd really appreciate your support. So I'd like to introduce Martin Atkins. Martin is an extraordinary innovator and entrepreneur who's also a musician. He founded uh, the band Pig Face about 16 years ago. He also played in several post-punk bands, including Killing Joke and Public Image Limited, which was Johnny Lydon's first post-Sex Pistols band. And he was even on American Bandstand with that band. So we talked a little bit about that. Um, he just, at the time of recording this episode, we, he had just completed uh, this Midwest Music Expo that he organizes, which is basically a musician's conference that actually featured a scratch and sniff element to it, if you can imagine that. And he explains that a little bit. He is an author. He um, wrote the book called Tour Smart and the follow on book Band Smart, which are both um, excellent hands on manuals for touring, both for professionals and for outsiders that just want to know what it's like to tour and what uh, artists are up against when they're on the road. Um, it's a really fun and interesting read. And he taught a course on that book at Columbia College here in Chicago. He also runs the music business program at Millican College here in Illinois. What I love about Martin is his DIY spirit, really. It's kind of the punk ethos, like, here's a chord, here's another chord, start a band, as he says. He uses that attitude in his marketing and how he creatively goes about connecting himself with his fans. Um, he's an innovator in his approach, um, and he appreciates what other artists do and wants to uh, promote others uh, and expose others. He believes that by promoting others, you can promote yourself. He talks about everybody from Melissa Etheridge to a band called Sophie Tucker. And those are really interesting stories about what they're doing right now in COVID to get to their fans. And, you know, this period of COVID has been difficult for everybody. Martin is making really the best of it and um, talks about the different ways that he's approached this period and, and how ways even prior to COVID, he had been an innovator in getting his fans in front of his band, doing things just differently than than um, than others might have, or just an unique approach that um, seems sort of crazy, but works for him. I think you'll really enjoy this interview. He's just a really fascinating human, has a lot of interesting things to say about the music business, where we're headed now, um, and where we've been, and has a lot of great stories along the way. So thanks again to all of you for tuning in to this interview. I know you'll really enjoy this with Martin Atkins. So here we go. I've got Martin Atkins with us. He's a the quintessential post-punk entrepreneur. This is Roadcase. Hi, Martin. How are Hi, you doing? You. The, I'm, I'm doing good. That's very nice of you to say that. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. I mean, I really, really appreciate your time. I know you're super busy with all this kind of stuff you're doing, but you were just telling me this story about Melissa Etheridge and how we're kind of on this, we're already so far down the road in this post-modern COVID era of live shows and uh and new streaming models i mean tell me a little bit about what your what your own thinking is on that well but, well my own thinking is you've got to jump in you know we had we did a really interesting thing we've been doing a lot of interesting things but two weeks ago 
we we secured the rights to broadcast um, a, a documentary called "Who the Fuck Is That Guy," and it, <laughs> it, it, it's a documentary about the life of Michael Anthony Alago, and um, uh, he signed Metallica when he was twenty four. Wow. He actually worked with PIL, and yesterday uh-huh. was the forty first anniversary of the Metal Box with PIL. He he yeah, worked yeah. with PIL when we were on Electra. He ended yep. up executive producing Nina Simone's last album, you know. And so um, we did. We screened the documentary, and we had a Q and A with Michael and the director of the documentary, Drew Stone, and um, you know it was, it was quite fabulous, but. Here's the interesting thing. Yeah. Here's the interesting thing to me. We didn't test this out beforehand. We just threw it up on Zoom, right? And there were points at which <laughs> the lag between the people's mouths moving and the audio, I want to say six to eight seconds. <laughs> okay. So I'm like, and I'm just sitting there. I'm going, what the? and and. Um, so Drew Stone, who made the documentary, it's been on Netflix for three years. He's there. His father, who won a freaking Academy Award for some, I don't know what what movie he made, but he's sitting watching it with his father. And I'm just, I'm sitting there waiting for somebody to go, okay, stop. This is <laughs> unacceptable. Technically, I can't sit here with my father. We can't sit. And nobody right, nothing. Knew it because everybody was on the chat off to the side. And I'm like, holy shit. So I see musicians all the time going, yeah, I'm not satisfied with the sound quality. It's like, oh, shut up. Nobody cares about the sound quality. People want to connect. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, that's the, the absence of that in the show people are doing in the chats, right? Exactly. So what you're saying, no one noticed about the delay. So did it end up to be okay in the end? <laughs> People noticed they just didn't care. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like nobody said anything, but like you watch people ditching out the numbers. Like, did you do? People stayed for hours afterwards. Wow, wow. And, um, and I'm like, holy crap! People just want to connect. And we we did a thing on Saturday. It was the 30th anniversary of a Killing Joke album that I made, and. Um, there was drunken Scottish people screaming, <laughs> you know. Like, <laughs> like, it was like, okay, you know, M- M- Molly, who helps me, was like muting microphones as best she could, you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we was we were going to play some monitor mixes and some demos, and that didn't work, and nobody cared, and we went for three and a half hours, and yeah. and that's what it is right now. It's people just want to connect, and if if you if you think about what we do as musicians, mm-hmm. you know, we put on a great show. Really, in order to, uh, for me, to create a platform to to communicate with my friends on stage and to interact with an audience before, during, and after the show, and yeah. you know, and so you take away the music and the sweat, and I spit in the air and I bleed. You take <laughs> away you can. Actually, I can connect more now because, as I said when we were talking earlier, after a pig face show, for instance, we yeah. live all on the stage. Two and a half hours, crazy tribal drumming. An hour after the show, I'll talk to anybody, but an hour after a show, I'm crying in my bunk, rubbing <laughs> whatever into my knees. And putting surgical super glue on my nipples. <laughs> get through. But but with a Zoom, I'll sit on a Zoom for three or four hours talking to people. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I mean, it's completely transformed the way that uh, bands, you know, have that essential interaction with fans, and fans have that essential interaction with bands. Hopefully, we'll get back to where we were possibly at some point down the future bent down the line but in absence of that there's been so much that's going on that's um kind of a net positive for the industry i mean to say that the, everyone's made lemonade from lemons is an understatement really right right and i i think we had i, I was pretty fortunate you know um 
in, I want to say April. Um, you know, I teach down at Millican University in Decatur, mm -hmm. yep, Illinois. I know that. Yeah. We do all this stuff. And um, I put on an event with students called MMX, the Midwest Music Expo. Mm -hmm. It's designed to have people come. We've got this amazing campus. To have people come, come into the Commons building and there's panels and expos and booths and all this stuff. And, of course, we couldn't do it. We were scheduled to do one in May. And so we, we said the responsible thing in April was to cancel it. Right. And we did. And then within a week of doing that, I'm like, well, this doesn't feel right. And we started to do Zoom workshops and whatever. Uh -huh. We ended up doing a virtual conference. And we tripled attendance. And instead of having people from 200 miles radius of Decatur, Illinois, Chicago, St. Louis, wherever, we had people from 23 countries. You know, so it's like I, I saw very early on, this is bad. But it's not all bad. There's, right, there's right. There's a lining. And, and, you know, people could be doing events, reaching out, finding ways to connect, and building a network for the future, wh whatever the future holds. I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you know, I, I, I read a parts of the book, really enjoyed it. It's very, very interesting. I love the anecdotes that you have in there and the, the case studies from the road. It's, it's really well put together and it's, um, I really, really enjoyed it. It was really great. When I, I kind of, when I'm reading that and then looking at your amazing history and background with so many different, uh, rock bands and, um, everything that you've done and what you've seen, I was kind of wondering when was your first, when did you first have the notion to kind of become an instructor, mentor of rock music and touring? There's, there's a couple of things. One, um, to, to get involved in the nuts and bolts of touring happened in Texas with Killing Joke, um, where I sat, I sat down at my kit and I hit my bass drum and I looked over to the monitor guy and I said, hey, yeah. hey, hey, whoa, uh, turn on my drum fills. And he said the words you never want to hear, uh, they're, they're on. They're all on. I'm like, okay. So then immediately I know I'm going to blow my knee out. And then I'm like, okay, front of house. Turn on the house. So at least I'll get the boom, boom mm -hmm. but the slap. Of the, and it's like, uh, it's on. So, so I know immediately right. – my knees are going to get screwed. It's going to be an uncomfortable night for me. I'm not going to enjoy it. And people will be able yeah. to talk 10 rows back at the, uh, and the thing. And the reason for that mm -hmm. was somebody had allowed the promoter to, he thought, there's going to be 400 people. Instead of charging 12, I'll charge 20. And then I'll make eight grand instead of whatever, right? And, right. <clears throat> but, um, <laughs> Less than half of those 400 people bought tickets. Right. So then he had to save money by downgrading my monitors and the sound system and making it a shitty night for everybody. And I'm like, well, this was easily avoidable. Why wasn't anybody involved? So I started to manage Killing Joke um, and, and, and direct that. And then <clears throat> I started with my band Pig Face, I started to put five band package tours together like pig face fm einheit from a band called einsters and neubauten with a band in the uk called scorn or sheep on drugs or test department we'd do the immigration we'd fly people in we'd hire two buses we'd put one crew together to work for everybody there was change the changeovers were slick we were sharing equipment <clears throat> and then i went to columbia college chicago to get some interns to help. Uh, and I did a little presentation. I'm like, this is the tour we're doing. We're doing eight different promotional postcards with these partners. We're doing 20,000 promotional discs with Jägermeister. We're doing this. And, that. and they said, when can you start? And, I'm, and I actually said to them, I can put students in my car now and I can have interns working for me this afternoon. And they said, no, no, when could you start teaching this? And I, I actually said, 
what are you talking about? And like, you should be teaching touring. Wow. So what time frame was this? 16 years ago. Uh-huh. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I left school when I was 16. I, I have my master's degree now, but I left school when I was 16. Master's in what? Um, I don't even know. Like, creative. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I don't know. I got my master's because I don't like to be fucked with by people who have done one sixtieth of the shit that I've done. So yeah, for sure, right? Great. So it's not like I can't be dis. It's like creative media or something. Yeah, you got you went and got a couple initials. Yeah, <laughs> but I thought that was an interesting thing to do to teach, and I thought yeah. that, that was the opportunity. But the opportunity was um, that there wasn't a book. So I started to write the book and that became tour smart. And I thought that was the opportunity and it wasn't the opportunity was speaking around the world, uh, off the back of tour smart. So I started, I had like five years where I was like every Melbourne, Australia, five trips to Norway, Berlin, uh, Medellin, Bogota. What medium or what kind of venue would that be? Like a a, um, a conference or a uh, conference where um, I'd be the kind of uh, I'd be the guy who says fuck, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you got to see this guy. He's gonna yeah. <laughs> the guy with the crazy white hair. Was it white? Was the hair white yeah, back white then? Has too? been white for a while. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I, you know, um, uh, it was really interesting. I mean, I came up through punk. Where, where nothing really uh, alarms anybody. But you say fuck in an international conference where half of the people are wearing headsets getting simultaneous translations from yeah. interpreters. And it's, right. it's fun. It's a fucking... <laughs> yeah. So you went around the world and you lectured this book when it was kind of in the works because it came out in like a couple of years. It had, had it already come out or? I, I think it's 10 years old now. Tour Smart is 10 yeah. years old. I think it was, I, I saw it was 2007 or something, but maybe I was looking at a different. That I don't sounds, know. yeah, that sounds right. Uh, yeah. And then, um, you know, I, I hesitated a little bit. A couple of people said to me, why are you putting that in a book? You could be a consultant. And and I thought, oh hello, but yeah, but you just it just like I just don't want anybody to make any of those mistakes again, you know. Cause right. I made them all. People keep making the same mistakes, so it's like here they are. Just there's another set of mistakes you can make after these. It's not like there will never be anything for me to do, you know. Well, it's 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 surprising because it's a lot of really common sense things, but then once you once you talk talk about them, bring them out in the open, and kind of categorize them, it sort of makes it easier for people to get their arms around it. And obviously, not everyone's going out and following all those directions to the letter, unfortunately. But um, the interesting part about that book really is kind of really the 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 DIY spirit, the do it yourself kind of spirit that's really in every page of that of, of what you say in that book and. I can tell that it's sort of been a guiding principle in the way that you do things. I mean, to from today all the way back. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, so the, the guiding principle of punk is here's a chord, here's another, here's a third, start a band. You know, right? And and yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it never. This it's slightly interesting. It sounds like I'm trying to say something about myself, which I'm not. It never occurred to me that I couldn't or shouldn't put my own 650 page book together and release it myself. And that's amazing. That's amazing. And, and that's, that's just punk, you know? And, um, yeah. Uh, and I, I made a mistake. I signed a deal with a publisher after I sold 10,000 copies. I'm like, now I should do this properly. And I signed a deal and the margins went to shit. Next thing you know, Amazon selling it for less than I can buy it for. And I'm oh. just like, and, you know, but at its core, the book itself is DIY. And I, do, I will put 300 copies in my van and just go and speak in a record store. I DJ for somebody. I do a consultation gig. I go and speak at a school. If I saw a tour bus at the truck stop, I bang on the window. Hey! And people are like, who is this guy looking for autographs? I'm like, I'm <laughs> I wrote a book. And I meet people now who are like, 
10 years ago, you came on our bus and you gave us this book. And they'll show me the book with post-it notes all the way through it. And, and at least are, the, are they are they thanking you that they, you help them like, does, you know, yeah. do things better at yeah. least? And people lose their copies or they give their copies to people. You know, uh, it, it was really an interesting, um, an interesting journey for sure. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, you should talk to Amazon because like I th I had they only said I had they had one copy and I bought it and it, I think it was used and it had a lot of highlighting in it, but maybe they maybe in you know I can come help you do some press. I'm from I I'm here in Chicago too and matter of fact Columbia, I'm in the Columbia College uh neighborhood here. So. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um can you talk a little bit about you? You were in a band, you know, Public Image with Johnny Lydon. What was that like? I mean, not to to go back to that a little bit because I'm super interested in it. And I know but other people are. You can go back to anything you want. Um, this is this is very much on my mind, like now. So, like yesterday was the 41st anniversary of the release of the Metal Box. Yeah, um, that was uh, I co-wrote and played on a song called Bad Baby the last song to go on that album. It's ridiculous that I look at this six month period of my life was um, playing on metal box, which was, that's my first five minutes and 20 seconds with the band. Uh huh. It wasn't rehearsed. Somebody said, yeah, the drums are over there. It was studio a at the townhouse where queen recorded where Phil Collins, Wow. We all, we've all used the Studio B drum room as well. That's where he did In the Air Tonight. I did Flowers of Romance. Um, wow, that's amazing. Uh, so it was that. Then we did John Peel. Then we did uh, Paris Au Printemps, January 17th and 18th, 1980. That was recorded for a live album. Um, that was my first gig, two gigs with the band. And then right. Old Grey Whistle Test. Then we jumped on a plane, live television. Then we jumped on a plane and did tw uh, 12 shows in the U.S., which included American Bandstand. And like uh -huh. the most ridiculous six months, you know. Um, and it was wild. What is that like on American Bandstand doing that? Can you talk, tell me a little bit about that? Well, we didn't – people people say, and I don't want to mess up everybody's ideas – but people say, no, please, please do, please do. <laughs> so, so American Bandstand. What happened was John ran away from the cameras, but the ABC they were like camera two, camera one. Like they covered him really well, even though he was running all over the place. And then yeah. he pulled everybody down from the bleachers to to camouflage the fact that Warner Brothers had edited the songs down from seven minutes to four. Uh, careering and pop tones and he didn't know where the vocals were going to come in and we were lip syncing so um people like to say that pill deconstructed the american the iconic uh, eroded the foundations of the and really we just didn't know what we were doing you know but, but it was fucking great i mean they still show that um uh, it, it was really amazing. Dick Clark was really upset. Um, he said we were disrespectful to Bandstand and it shouldn't be aired. And then people said, no, no, it should be aired. And it was just ridiculous. Wow. You know? Did he interview, did he interview John after the, like do that little post uh, present, you know, the post performance interview that he's so famous he for? He did it in between the two songs, which is great because it's like, and you are, I'm like, Martin, Martin Atkins, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it, the second song, it was just so ridiculous. I gave Jar Wobble, the bass player, the drumsticks, and I started playing bass. It, <laughs> I mean, um, part of it was, honestly, we did not give a fuck. You know, yeah. um, we played to 3,000 people one night, 10,000 people another night. But part of it was also we just didn't know. I, I didn't know what American Bandstand was. If I'd grown right. up watching it, I think – I, I remember definitely Old Grey Whistle Test in the UK. I'd grown up watching that as a kid. I watched Cream yeah. on there. I watched The Tubes. I watched all kinds of different bands on there. Oh, love The Tubes. Love The Tubes. Uh, so that was like, that was very different, you know. 
yeah. to be on live TV, thinking about myself watching that. Yeah, that was, yeah. That, I don't know that much about it. This old gray whistle test is that less poppy than American Bandstand, or is it kind of like the British equivalent? No, no. no, it was late night, super cool. Oh yeah, kind of like the Don Kirshner's rock concert kind of vibe, right? Maybe you yeah. got to think John Peel. Like whistle test would put like three bands on, you know, and you get like fifteen minutes each with a little bit of news and an interview. And there's definitely that John Peel kind of here's something you don't know about, but you should kind of deal, you know? Right, right, right. So you did that whole tour with pill that year. That was, yeah. uh, so 40 years ago. So that was roughly, that was about eighties, right? That was not, yeah, that was April, April, 1980. We landed in Boston. Nice. Did you go to the West coast at that point? I mean, I'm only asking cause I'm from, I'm from LA and I was, uh, like in high school, you know, like 10th grade around that time. Yeah. We played the Olympic auditorium in LA. Oh, nice. I mean, riot police on horseback, 10,000 crazy punks, uh, right. helicopters, wow. riot police. Oh, it was insane. It was insane. It was. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, and then you, um, uh, pig face. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, you, uh, you founded this band and it's kind of known as a, a super group and it's, it's amazing the number of people that have come and gone and been in that band. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit from yeah. kind of the collaborative perspective? Well, okay. Yeah. So just, to, just to dial it in. So I spent, I was fired from pill twice, but about <laughs> five years with pill. And then I left and yeah. I spent a couple of years in killing joke. Then I toured with ministry on the cage tour, which is, Mm -hmm. realized as in case you didn't feel like showing up and while that ministry tour was happening i was still in killing joke and i looked around the stage and you had ogre from skinny puppy chris connelly from the revolting cox uh kmfdm opened on that tour me and bill rieflin who bill rieflin isn't around anymore uh, yeah sorry about that I know. We, we we had this it was like we were a fa I, I said we were a fantastic ministry cover band what would happen if we just did some stuff and uh i talked mm -hmm. to al i mean al brought us all together al jorgensen and um i'm like hey i i want to do something let's do something and he wasn't interested he did come into the studio and he like drank a bottle of bushmills or something but the day that that's the tour ended i had studio time booked for three days at Chicago Tracks Recording with Steve Albini because I knew I could never afford to fly everybody back, but I wanted to experiment, and that's what we did. The first Pig Face album was very experimental. Steve Albini right. played some guitar. Uh, Trent Reznor, I flew Trent out from Cleveland to sing when nobody, nobody had a clue who Nine Inch Nails were then. I think mm -hmm. 5,000 albums. And... Um, it was just wild. You know, we did a song with some tape loops where they're speeding up and slowing down. It was like an obstacle course. And like, I didn't care if somebody thought, well, hold on a minute. This song is speeding up and slowing down. It's like, it was just a point in my life where I don't, it wasn't that I didn't care, but I didn't think I had anything to prove anymore. And so right. what happens? Let's have David Yao from the Jesus come and do a song and, and we'll do this and we'll do that. And um, we took it out on the road, and live, it really took on a life of its own. So people would just wander on stage. Um, Al Keezy's from the Swans, or Beef, the bass player from Gua, or Trent Reznor, or a, a, a five uh, a fireman in Philadelphia in full Scottish regalia playing bagpipes. Or, <laughs> and people would just jump up on stage and do that. Well, I kind of, I would make it known that we were in Eng engineered it. Yeah, we were look. You know, they're like, I'm like, would you play bagpipes? And like, yeah, well, for a bottle of whiskey. Okay, <laughs> done, done. Um, cello, harp, sitars, so belly dancers. So then, then, so I'm, we're we're a post-punk industrial supergroup, as you said. 
Mm-hmm. That gives us, I think, license to, you've got everybody's attention. Like, all right, bagpipes, sitar, cello, harp, you know, uh, or Galen Lee playing fiddle, you know, and it's a unique opportunity to get people to question what, what every what they think everything is about. Right, right. I mean, it's it's performance art, really. And then, and the more you do it, the more everybody understands what it is. So we didn't play for like 10, 12 years. We did a show at the House of Blues in Chicago in twenty sixteen. And we, how long did you play when the, out of that in that first stretch? What, what, in twenty sixteen. No, you said you took a break for it for quite a while. So how? But you began it. How long was that first stretch? And then you took a break. 15, 16 years. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's quite a while. And then, um, and then we did twenty shows last year. Mm-hmm. You know, Danny Carey from Tool, Andrew Weiss from Rollins, Randy Blythe from Lamb of God, Greta Brinkman from Moby, Charles Levi from Thrill Kill, Mary Biker from Gay Bikers. Leslie Rankin from Silverfish and Ruby, like just ridiculous. Yeah. 27 yeah. people on stage at Thalia Hall, five drum kits. I saw that. I saw that Thalia Hall, uh, some clips from that show with just the, the big lighting on the background, just shit. Yeah. Well, and, and, Illuminate, which was like, okay, sure. Let's do it. But that, <laughs> it was great. That's just punk as hell. So yeah. there's an undertones seven in single and it, and it says on the back um teenage kicks and it says on the back the undertones are shit so by doing that you just own it you know um so if a journalist says eh, i think pig face was shit like yeah we we played underneath the word shit eight feet high <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. and it, it's it's really cool and the you guys were synonymous with shit. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell? Christmas tree lights attached to chicken wire. So, yeah. did, you know, and we just have a blast. And the more we do it, the more we can do it. Um, we had two sitar players last time. Um, you know, our sound guy's like, oh, okay, five full drum kits tonight. Oh, three <laughs> Great. players. Okay. You know, it's just like, uh, we've we've created the template, if you like, where yeah, he and knows what it is. And you had a tour that was supposed to go out in 2020, right? I mean, have you were you able to replicate that at all in a streaming sense, or have you kind of just put it on hold, or what's sort of the status right now? Uh, it, it's on hold. We did a um, we did a stream of the Thalia Hall show, which was in conjunction with 57 other venues. Um, to, to generate some money for the venues themselves. They mm-hmm. paid 50% of the tickets and uh, uh, donations to BLM, Neva, Hope for the Day, and Black Kids Swim. Right. But there's, there's no way uh, we can put 27 people on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like even in this, even with every direction that things are going, that would be kind of difficult to do. Yeah, for sure. But we were talking about before kind of the, before we got on air, we were chatting about uh, the new direction and streaming people asking when we're coming back to normal, when we're going to be back to normal. And you had a lot of interesting things to say about that. Can we talk, can we go back and talk about that a little bit and kind of where you're seeing music head right now and how you see that? You told me you see that kind of as a net positive. I, I think there's definitely a silver lining. And um, if you look at Melissa Etheridge, um, so when lockdown happened, she went straight onto Facebook Live for 57 days in a row at three o'clock and she performed live. And then her son died in an opioid related uh, uh, accident, I think. And she took some time off and then came back on her own white label branded uh, site through a company called Maestro and now has a thousand subscribers pay Mm -hmm. $50 a month to be, uh, to see Etheridge TV or whatever she calls it. And she has five different things that happen each week. Um, she listens to, uh, she puts up old videos. She does cover songs. She has a talk show with her partner. They do a concert on a Saturday and I don't know what the other one is. Um, they've already 
I went and looked at her schedule. Excuse me, schedule. Uh, they're already doing a cruise, which of course is not a real cruise, but I guarantee you that the merchandise associated with the pretend cruise is very real. Yeah, for sure. Uh, her partner is a, a TV executive, so they put together a seven camera mobile uh, studio in the garage, which is where they do their sessions from. But they're going to take that on the road whenever things get back to normal. But the reason things aren't going to be normal is uh, by the time Melissa Etheridge goes on the road, she'll be on version seven of whatever it is she's doing. She's tweaking yeah. everything. She's looking at engagement. Um, they'll turn the seven camera studio into this mobile rig that will still involve all of those thousand subscribers because she neither wants to wave goodbye to the subscribers and the connection. Um, and they'll use this rig to plant seeds for the future, connect with people from the past. You were at the show. Here's your past to two free Melissa TV events coming up. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and, and somebody said to me, it seems to be all you old fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> we were doing stuff, and and I thought about it, and I'm like, well, you know, all we've ever done is make things work that shouldn't. You know, anybody who's been on the road, right, we've all walked into venues and gone, oh, my God, was there an earthquake? Did somebody break into this club last night and steal most of the equipment? It's like, no, that's the sound system, and the toilet don't work and the lights don't work and there isn't enough power and it's shitty and you don't have enough room on stage and nothing right. the way anybody said it will be but you make the show work and so yeah, that's yeah. what we do that's what touring professionals do whether it's external with the venue or it's internal you know, just somebody just told me my cat's died or i've got diarrhea you make it work so <laughs> and, and we've all survived analog to two inch tape what's happening oh no hold on a minute we're releasing an album that's over we're doing cassettes that's we're doing cds now we're not doing cds it's itunes now it's streaming now vinyl's back we're, right there's a drum machine now we can do the like adap yeah. you know we've all we've we've we're used to navigating this yeah yeah i mean you said our generation do you not think young people are doing this right now um, yeah, young younger artists, let's say. Yeah, I I think so. Right. But yeah, but if if this is your first wave of shit, it's difficult. If it's your tenth yeah. wave of shit, yeah, it can get you down. Yeah, for sure. That's a good point. Yeah, I was in Poland with Killing Joke during the first Gulf War. We're like, hey, how's it going? Not very well. America's at, what the fuck? You know, I mean, we, we it's like. Yeah, I crossed the Canadian border with one one of our two buses had an outbreak of spinal meningitis. Oh right, I read about that. Yeah, so it's like, okay. So so when the pandemic hits, I'm not being frivolous at all, but it's like, yeah, here's these fifteen things. Yeah, it's a Tuesday, you know, <laughs> you know, what, what can do? you know, and I and I've seen, yeah, that's a. I mean, that's, that's, that's a great attitude. I mean, that's an attitude of success moving forward, running to your problems, right? Is what I was saying. And then you like ripped off of that. And I, I've seen people who've been on the road with pig face and I'm like, you know, I'll find like an inflatable raft. And so we'll take rides on the audience. So we'll, we'll put 15 trees in buckets full of concrete across the stage covered in Christmas tree lights because it's unindustrial. And we'll have five <laughs> drummers and yeah. And anybody who's done that, you know, I, when I say to them, are you okay with this? Can you manage that? Can you do this? So like, we were on the road with pig face for two years. We can deal with anything really, you know? Right. And so yeah. the, the, that spirit, I think gives us an advantage. There's also, um, I was, somebody was talking to me yesterday about a duo called Sophie Tucker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're just like, same thing as Melissa Etheridge. Every day, three o'clock, bang, bang, bang. Mm -hmm. They understand that. Um, they just dancing, creating a platform that they're then 
giving to other people. Um, uh, people are doing interesting things. And, and then they started to expose, give their platform. Like, it's 3 o'clock Tuesday. Hey, we're Sophie Tucker. Listen to these people. So it's like, whoa, that, that's the thing. Yeah, the cross-pollination. The cross-pollination. And also, however desperate you are to get your music heard, you're going to get further by shining a light on other people. Oh, explain that a little so bit. So if, if you... If you tell me, there's a whole there's a whole thing about this. I have a thing called the Martin Atkins Minute on NPR. And, okay, and this is called the. Is that a is that a pot is that a podcast? It's on, which which podcast is that on? It's on uh, All Songs Considered. Okay, and um, the Blackberry Jam scam is basically look. I don't care about your music. Nobody cares about your fucking music. But if you make your own BlackBerry Jam, ooh, I'm kind of ooh, I'm kind of interested, you know. So this thing happened to me, where this student—I uh, had a student up in Madison when I was teaching up in Madison, and he had this pot of jam in front of him, and it was defrosting. I'm like, what is this? He's like, I'm—I grow my own blackberries, and this is my organic homegrown blackberry jam. I'm like, oh, fucking hell, you know. And <laughs> bring me some of that. The next week he brought me some jam, and as I'm reaching for the jam, he gives me his CD, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And um, I honestly thought, and I'm going back six years now, I honestly thought it's okay because I don't like listening to other people's music because I'm a producer. So I'll, I'll yeah. arrange it in my head. I'll wake up at four in the morning. Now that bit needs to go there. And it's like, look, if you haven't employed me, I can't put that in my head. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I thought it's okay. Take his demo and I can throw it out the window on the drive back from Madison to Chicago. <laughs> and I told him he got, it was like freaked out. But I, I, of course, I'll still keep the jam. And then I got back to Chicago, and the CD was still in my car. I'm like, oh fuck it. And then uh, the next morning, I hadn't thrown the CD out, and I put the toast in the toaster, spread the butter, and I spread the jam on the toast. And as soon as I bit into the toast, I'm like, fuck. Now I've got I've got to listen to this demo now. That was the deal, and I, you know. And I tell people that story, and some a lot of people are just horrified. Like, well, we give the gift of our music. I'm like, your music is not a gift to me. It's an imposition. You need my time. You're going to take my energy, and it's going to be in my brain. Your music is not a gift to me. And nobody will say that. Uh, but I said, if you've got some jam, <laughs> you know, like if you understand, if you if you really want something from me, give me some fucking jam. And and then this guy in New Orleans, he came up to me at a conference, and he said, "I've got eighty thousand bees in my back garden." I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "This is organic, honey." I'm like, "Okay, where's your fucking demo?" You know. And we still talk to. So that's that's an attitude I think that musicians need. Like, if you want something, give something. Yeah. I mean, wait, but did you listen to the the disc? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a deal. Uh, similarly, somebody in Pittsburgh sent me five pounds of their coffee and two heavy metal albums, and I didn't drink the coffee and I didn't listen to the albums because I knew, look, if I, if, I, if I drink this coffee, I'm, I, don't, I wasn't in the mood to listen to the albums. And um, right. so that's one. But secondary... After the pandemic, if you haven't changed your pitch, if your pitch is, yeah, oh, the pandemic. Anyway, here's four songs. And the interesting thing about the xylophone on track two is there actually isn't anything interesting about the xylophone on track two. You know, the interesting thing is, tell me what you've done. Oh, you painted this old lady's house or you're mentoring these people or you're doing this. There's a band in Chicago called Ganser Band. They came up on, I really like them. And they came up like, hey, our band camp Friday, half of the money is going to BLM, the bail fund and Chicago Food Depository. From yeah. T-shirts and our music, 
you get half the money. And I called them up. I'm like, well, I'll make, the, I'll give you the t-shirts. I'll make t-shirts for you. So you'll have more money to give to somebody else. And so, um, uh, it, it's a time to shine a light on other people. And because, I mean, I think you should, but also selfishly, if you want to expose yourself, nobody, no, you can't do that right now anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, the, you know, again, it's the DIY spirit. It's your very, very admirable philanthropic side also. But um, yeah, if you're giving other people something, uh, from a marketing perspective, they're going to remember that. And hopefully you'd come back to, to, to listen to that original album. Right. Right. I mean, and that's how it works. It's like, yeah. It, you know, if you, if you like Sophie Tucker, if you're spending your time shining, giving your base to other people, well, now I'm interested, you know, and actually here's the other weird thing. If I if I like what you're doing, I don't give a shit what your music sounds like. I mean, I honestly don't. I think musicians think the ultimate chord, whatever it is, will create such inroads that whatever else is lacking will be excused. And I think it's the other way around. I think it's who you are and what you do. If I like you, I don't give a shit if you fuck up you know and your guitar's out of tune it's the other way around well that's a punk that's i mean i don't mean this you know you know in a bad way but that's the punk rock ethos right i mean it's like what what we're doing and how we're doing it is more important than the chords that we're playing i mean the chords that playing became important i mean the clash went from punk band to doing London Calling, right? Right. For example. <laughs> uh, so they did care as a, at, at, at the end of the day. Well, Although the next album, they had the fight with CBS Records and then blah, blah, blah. Right. I mean, I don't mean to blah, blah, blah that, but you know what I mean? <laughs> That's a big deal. But it, you're, you're, are you saying that it's, it is um, substance over form? Yeah, I am. Because, so what it is now, you go full circle and... You've got people, you know, throwing away their Morrissey albums because of his right-wing political stance, you know. So you have a performer as substantial uh, uh, as Morrissey, and people are like, fuck it. I don't care what his music sounds like. I'm not supporting this asshole, you know. So substance is a... Um, is a large part of this. It's like uh, um, ethically grown coffee. You know, yeah. I don't care right. what your coffee tastes like if you're exploiting, um, if you're exploiting workers in Guatemala. Although, if you're doing great things, that's a good thing. But if your coffee sucks, yeah. Well, so <laughs> so here's the here's the thing. Um, there's a there's a guy called Moldova. M O L D O V A R. Mm -hmm. He has an album that um, uh, it's on a circuit board in a CD case, and the song titles are written in circuitry on the back, which I think is really great. Hmm. Um, but there's also a circuit, and you can press a button on the spine of the the the, the plastic box. And it's a light sensitive theremin. And I have been all over the world, keynoted Melbourne Music Week, Berlin, whatever the hell place I did in Berlin, all over the world, Moldova, Moldova, and pass this around. You, so you can play the disc or you can replay the box, this light sensitive theremin. And somebody said to me, um, I don't know when. Well, what does the album sound like? I'm like, I have no clue. I don't care. I'm like a fucking genius, and I, you know, it do, just doesn't. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. Um, right. I think you know. Um, uh, and I, I, I thought a couple of years ago, I thought, well, perhaps I should listen. I'm like, no, why? Why do I need to listen? Uh, you know, it doesn't. It's not going to change my opinion of him either way. Right. Um, so. Um, 
I know I think that opinion uh, can tread on people's technical proficiency, you know, and I used to spend five hours a day practicing my drums from the age of nine to the age of 18, um, uh, you know, and obviously played a lot. I was in ministry, kill and joke and pig face at the same time, um, where I'm lucky enough to work with the most ridiculous people. Andrew Weiss came uh, to the show in New York, played bass with Rollins and, and Ween. And um, somebody said to me, uh, is he just going to do a song? I mean, does he know any of the songs? I'm like, it doesn't matter. Shut up. And he just like, doo -doo 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 -doo. he just watched and knew what everybody was doing. And he didn't fit in. He embroidered. He was himself over the top of this glory. It was like, us with Andrew. It wasn't like make sure he fits in and nobody knows. You want to know that Andrew is, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know. So um, I, I don't mean to tread on anybody's toes from a technical aspect, but I, I wish people would spend more time on all of the other aspects, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's that's evident in what you've written about touring, about how people should just get involved in everything. Like, you know, a lot of an undercurrent and the underlying theme in the book is if you're not doing this, you're not doing it right. And why aren't you doing this? And why are you giving it to someone else to do? Right. And, and but if you're doing it, you can do it wrong. And as long as you, you know, as long as your radar is up pretty quickly, you'll find out how, how to do it right for you and your band with your instrumentation and your unique situation. Yeah. which is that that piece is missing from anybody else you bring in that succeeded with somebody else is, is your unique vibe. And you hope that everybody has a unique vibe or a combination that creates a unique vibe. And so how do you reinforce that? And, and what do people respond to? And yeah. What do you, what, what are you bringing to the table other than instruments and big amplifiers? Right. Right. Is what you're saying. And, and I'm, I'm still, I'm still, you know, I'm 61 and I'm still learning two Thursday nights ago. As I said, I'm sitting watching this like seven second lag between voices and not <laughs> yeah. moving. Right. I'm like it does, it doesn't fucking matter, which sounds like a punk approach. It doesn't matter. We're in the chat. But it yeah. really didn't matter. Nobody said, whoa, you know, I mean, it was making me dizzy to like to right. watch this stuff. But it honestly didn't matter. The the um, And if you watch CNN now, you'll see lag on Skype or Zoom interviews that was just unacceptable a year ago. You know, and just when you think they're going to, cut away from an interview because it's yeah <laughs> you don't the the presenters have learned to just kind of wait for it to you know, maybe it's going to come back and sometimes well, yeah it, oh, it depends what they're saying though so it, there's a little bit of form there i mean because people do want to hear what people are saying uh do you see yourself going back on tour martin um well yeah uh I, I don't see myself not like, so, yeah. and there's a few reasons for that. Um, Leslie described pig face as like, wow, it changes every night. And I'm just, I'm just starting to understand, you know, um, what this is. Leslie sang with us in the, in the early nineties, but didn't tour with us. Um, Randy Blythe from Lamb of God came out for three days to fill in for Mary Biker. And he said to us after three days, I'm doing the whole fucking tour. You know, like, <laughs> you know that's how you so, get 25 people on stage is that no one leaves, right? You're like, <laughs> and so there's that. Um, and that's part of my past where we never rehearsed with PIL. It was just, it was performance art. And, and so I'm relaxed enough to experiment on stage, lucky enough to have these crazy people well but on the so, other hand you've got an amazing technical background you just finished telling me that you practice for five hours a day from the age of nine to 18 so when you say you're not really rehearsing that doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing well right but 
But um, I mean, and there was there was an interesting. I've got to say, there was an interesting point. Um, I think we were in Denver on the last tour, and the singers, five, six people singing, started to work things out. So they, you know, physically weren't elbowing each other in the face, trampling on each other. Um, vocally, lyrically, musically weren't trampling in on, on each other. And um, this, <laughs> they said to me, for Chicago, can we have like no surprises? And I'm like, what that means <laughs> <coughs> but okay but i'd forgotten that i'd spoken to add two who has a great album out right now called uh, jim crow the musical he's from he, he's a mentor at the haven uh, at 46th and king drive it's a studio it's a hangout place uh, for his mentees and um i've forgotten i'd said to him Send me four of your rappers. Let's let's jam. <laughs> and uh, and so these four kids show up at uh, Jay Lamar, Cam, Just Chris, and Day. And I'm like, oh fuck. So I snuck them on stage with Orville Klein, who runs our samples. I'm like, can you run that beat from that one song? And so they heard the beat and then and then they just came out. Wow. Like uh and um uh, everybody who'd asked me for no surprises still says that was the coolest thing on stage. That's amazing. Ever. That's amazing. And so, so, so the next time we go out, maybe some of those people will surprise me with some stuff. Like once it's okay and people react and there aren't any rules, then there aren't any rules and it's okay. And you know, so, um, but there are, but there are kind of limit. Like we we started the whole conversation and like talking about how the paradigms are changing. But there are kind of limitations. I mean, Pigface can't do. It, it appears. Let's say I'm not going to speak in absolutes, but it appears that you can't really do that online. But that's kind of that is a live performance, right? Which is not to say that there won't be in the future. You won't go. You could go to Talia Hall and uh, shoot it right with a limited sized audience and then stream that but you know it's it's that is it is it how much really is the power of live uh play into what pig face does because you've got the 20 people on stage you've got a crowd that's that's putting energy out there and you're feeding off of that so well, where do, kind of where do you see that going like what's the future of that well well so when we played in 2016, um, uh, I was using a program called Z Maps. Uh -huh. So, everybody who we put ridiculous VIP packages together with like a seven inch single, two t shirts, this and that, and this and Fantastic. that. Fantastic. Some, yeah. some Blackberry jam. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, um, uh, so we know where everybody's from. We know their zip codes because we've got to mail this stuff to them. So we start putting it through this program called Z Maps, and, and so we see where everybody's from. And I'm like, people are coming from all over the country and Manchester, England, and a few other places. I'm like, so what's everybody going to do the night before Thanksgiving? Because we, we played House of Blues on Thanksgiving. And so I'm like, well, if people are arriving the day before Thanksgiving or the day before that, we should do something the night before. So mm -hmm. we did a we did a dress rehearsal at Reggie's. Yeah. It was a surprise. Oh, yeah, I read about that. Yeah, that's right down the yeah. street from me. Oh, yeah, well, it's just up the street from me. Oh. And um, um, I used to live at 2024 South Wabash, that we had the whole third floor of that building. Oh, nice. Uh -huh. um, so then it's like, well, if we've got all these people coming to Reggie's, Reggie's have got great wings and they do great mac and cheese. What would it take for their chef to do a Thanksgiving dinner? And they said, well, fuck, it would cost about $11 a head. So then I emailed everybody and I said, look, the chef's going to come in. And if you want Thanksgiving dinner during our free rehearsal show, and then I'm standing in line 
to get some food. And it's, I'm like, oh, where are you from? Las Vegas. Oh, wow, okay. Where are you from? Las Vegas. Oh, you all came together? Like, no. And so these people had never met each other before. And so, and then I think people thought it was going to be this horrifying half hour rehearsal. We played a two hour set that was fucking wow. brilliant. And people are just like, whoa. And then in 2019, we, I thought it would be a great idea as a VIP add on, low cost to me, high value to the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, let's invite people to rehearsal. And that's a great fucking idea. The, I would love. So, so imagine this. So you think like, oh, okay, here we go. Well, 60 people come in. I'm like, well, if 60 people are coming in, we've got to get like four cases of PBR. Yeah, at least. Like, so, you know, and then pie-eyed pizza say, well, we'll send some pizzas over. So people are coming in going, oh, what's going on? And it's like, here's some pizza. The fridge is full. And we told if you, look, if you want to bring it, there's, there's cases in the fridge. Bring some beer if you want. And instead of it being a drain on us, when you're rehearsing with 60 fucking people, all taking pictures, so you've got 60 people feeding out to, to, feeding out to right. social. So you know, 15 years ago, we'd be rehearsing, and it's like, what's going on? I don't hear any bass. Oh, Charles Levi is eating Chinese food. You know, <laughs> you know, but when there's 60 people in the room, everybody's on their game. And our rehearsal was five times more productive wow. because – Everybody was we. The, everybody was paying attention because because we knew we were being watched by yeah. sixty people. And I'm like, fuck! I'm I was sixty years old then. I just discovered this at the age of sixty. <laughs> we'll never rehearse alone again. You know, it's like when you 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 get rid of that idea of putting on the show. When when you let people in to the preparation of the show, you don't lose yeah. anything. You actually gain in ways that you would That's never very think. Very interesting. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was fucking great. It was yeah, really for sure. Great. Did you do that any time? Have you done that again since then? No, because no, that was the last. That was the last. No, I got you. So so, but we but, were tying. We, I was I was asking you about uh, where Pigface is going in the future. So how does that kind of do you, do you see that happening and going forward or what, uh, what do you see 2021 looking like from a, from a touring perspective? I don't see it. Uh, I, I just don't see it at all. And here's why. Um, uh, so, so for pig face, I think next Thanksgiving Saturday, I'm doing like a zoom session where I'll show people, um, I'll just go through my files and pull out some photographs and tell some stories and we'll yeah. just chat. Um, so we'll do that. We'll connect in that way. I think 2021, as soon as you can tour, I think a bunch of people, I see like Alice Cooper has announced some right. dates. There'll be all of this uh, leveraged stuff going out. Mm -hmm. then we'll see, oh dear, most of the people who buy the sparkly jackets and the expensive merch, they're still recovering from whatever's happened to their jobs or whatever their yeah, situation. Yeah. So there's going to be this avalanche of all of the stuff that didn't happen in, in this year. So I think it's going to be a year before people start touring before it's even remotely doable for a lower tier band like Pigface. I mean, we do okay, but but um, we don't have the muscle of a larger agency. Right. Um, and, um, you know, we'll play to four or 500 people here, 11 or 1,200 people in Chicago. You know, um, it's okay, but we don't have the muscle to, uh, to leverage uh, uh, time spots. I mean, now you've got two years. You're going to have two years of, of backed up touring. Right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's going to well, be tough. And it'll be for some a while. kind of, like so, we were talking about, it'll be some kind of combination of streams and live music and that'll go on for a while. So, you know, it probably will be some kind of combination, right? Going forward. Yeah. And, and, and talking. And I know we just did a, um, 
the scratch and sniff oh, music I saw that. conference. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So we had a people who were involved got a card yeah. with it's it's like an homage to John Waters, uh, a movie called Polystyrene, and um, so there's eight smells, and so like Wendy Day, who did the largest, second largest hip hop deal, um, she got Eminem signed. Um, she changed the name of her panel to sniffing out the money, sniffing out the <laughs> revenue. So circle number seven, smell of money. Well, you know, and I don't think it did really, but, but circle number three was definitely burnt rubber. Yeah. So that was Michael. And this was like panel. a, this was a card with like seven different circles on it. And it was a scratch. And st- yeah, it was crazy. I mean, it was ridiculously time consuming. So I think the next, Maybe there'll be a pig face triple best of vinyl album with hand typed signed stuff with scratch and sniff. And there'll be a ceremony yeah. of like, okay, don't even open this till you've got three right. hours. <laughs> and, um, you know, listen to smell this, light this incense and listen to these sit yeah. tracks. And then when you're halfway through, Call this number, and, and we'll talk for five minutes before you head into the lab. It's amazing. I mean, the the for you, you're so creative and you're so um, resourceful. There, the sky's the limit, really. I mean, this is like this is a great time period for expansive thinkers that are not hemmed in by you know traditional um, you know, traditional models, right? I mean, it's all becoming what model people are thinking of. What can you create? What? How are we going to do this? You know. It's not so much like what are other people doing and this is the tour model, right? It's um, what can we do? How can we get out there? What can we promote? What can we cross promote? You know, uh, how much Blackberry Jam can we make and spread it out there and give to people so that they'll come back, remember us, and we're still creating? Um, right. right. So, so Sophie Tucker is shining a light yeah. on people. Maybe, maybe if you're in electronic music and you you like doing your remixes, throw one up on the screen and take it apart and put it back together and, you know, let people see your yeah. process. You know, it's a great time to just go like this, you know, and um, tried and true techniques like Thess One from Under the Stairs. They put out a free mixtape and that surprisingly had a thousand sales or a thousand downloads in mm-hmm. Beijing and they got contact mm. information they didn't have to get an agent. They called a promoter and said, we just had a 1,000 downloads. They booked a small show. They sold it out. So it's a great time to throw stuff yeah. out there. And if you think, how are we going to tour North America again? Maybe all the data tells you we need to be in Tokyo or we need to be in right. Canada or, or wherever it is. The key is to do stuff. Like when we, we screened a documentary and I learned that, a seven second lag yeah. is okay. We, I started doing uh, screen printing workshops and um, you know, I, I made a, a, a new coffee bag for dark matter and I just thought it was kind of silly and I wanted to do something, but it made quite a financial difference yeah. to them uh, in May. And um, so you do stuff and you don't know what's right. going to work. You don't, you know, you just kind of, as I say a lot, you do more of what works and less of what doesn't, and you keep doing that. So I know, so you do a lot of great things around Chicago, and one of them is Rock for Kids, um, which is a philanthropic organization, and you mentor people in the Chicago music scene. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I I used to work with Rock for Kids. Um, now I'm mentoring at Twenty One Twelve. Uh, I've got something coming up with those guys in in a week or so. Um, and I do workshops down at the Haven uh, with Ad Two um, here in Chicago, right. and I'm right. just trying to. Um, I love doing like a screen printing workshop, yeah, because I think it's mind blowing how easy that is. Yeah, I mean, you print a lot of your own T-shirts and print your own posters and print your own dollar bills. I saw. We'll keep that. We won't talk about that. <laughs> you, you, uh, it's it's really easy. To print something and then once again people are quite forgiving so if you print your own shirt and it's just okay 
People are fine with that's that. That's the cool part about it. Hey, look at this shirt that was printed. The guy, <laughs> the guy printed it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I try and, and do uh, as many workshops for that stuff as I can. Backdrop behind me for the Chris Connolly tour in 92 or 93. Yeah, they're, they're Percodan pills. Um, and that's UV sensitive ink. So we had these strip lights. So when the lights, yeah. the house lights went down, the pills were all floating. Oh, wow. That's yeah. great. Oh, so it's on a curtain or something that you would hang and then it would move and be glow in the dark or something. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. Well, Martin, thanks so much for being here. You've done, you've done, you're doing so much great stuff and you've got this amazing can do attitude. I just want to talk to you for hours and I hopefully, uh, I, I won't take up any more of your time, but, um, we're in the same neighborhood. We should hang out sometime. We'll go to Reggie's when this whole thing blows over and we'll have some beers and I'd, I'd love to get involved, uh, and, uh, learn more about everything that you do. And, um, if anyone out there hasn't read that book yet and considering touring or even just interested in touring um, and live music, that's an amazing, it's, it's a really great, a great book. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, at martinatkins.com, I know that, so Band Smart is the sequel to Tour Smart. Mm -hmm. it should really be the prequel. Because it's like everything about being in a band before you tour. Well, it talks a lot about that in Tour Smart, also, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a free download at martinatkins.com. I'm also doing free classes. I was doing a, a free touring class on Monday nights and Saturday mornings mm. to fill up all of my time. <laughs> I, I think it's a really good time for uh, artists who might reluctantly come to the table in search of knowledge. I think if I'm still learning, then every band in the country should be attending some kind of. Well, yeah, for sure. And you're managing like a sizable family as well. Right. I mean, <laughs> for, for boys. So it's a good time to, to increase your knowledge base. And I think there's information about that. at Martin Atkins. Yeah, too. absolutely. Okay. Martin, hopefully everyone will go there, learn more about you. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I really, really enjoyed talking to you. This was amazing, really. You've done a lot of great things. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, thanks for taking the time too, Josh. Nice yeah, to man. You. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay, so there you go. Uh, that interview with Martin Atkins was really interesting. I mean, you know, he's a guy that, as we talked about in a prior interview with Eric Frankhauser of Wilco, who's the tour manager, uh, Martin runs to his problems, man. That is a guy that likes to get it done, that doesn't wallow in the problems of today. Uh, you know, he's like, hey, it's a fucking Tuesday. Tell me what else I need to know. Like, this is the problem that there is. We're going to solve it. We're going to just create new approaches and we're going to create new solutions to difficult problems. And he's just got a really innovative and positive attitude that is just so great to hear. I love his ideas. I love his solutions. Um, and I love his stories. I mean, the guy's been on American Bandstand, which was amazing enough for me to hear that story. I think that was one, one of the funniest things that I've heard about that. Um, but his pure enthusiasm about solutions and his um, his appreciation of what other artists are doing during this time period or pre-COVID or at any time, um, just grasping on to ways to solve problems. Uh, it's just a really refreshing approach and I'm really grateful to have been able to talk to him. So I want to thank Martin again for being here with us on Road Case and sharing his history and his innovations and uh, his great stories with us. So thanks again, Martin. Thanks again so much for listening. And I'd like to encourage everyone to get involved with Roadcase. You can do so in a number of different ways. You can email me at info at roadcasepod.com with questions, comments, and even suggestions for guests. Or you can follow us on the socials, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We're at RoadcasePod. And we have a YouTube channel called Roadcase Podcast. And if you are able to and like to support Roadcase, 
We have a Patreon site at patreon.com slash roadcasepod. And of course, you can subscribe to this podcast on your favorite listening platform. And if you could please rate and review the podcast while you're there, that would be great. So I want to thank Waltzer for this awesome theme music that we have. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in and listening to Roadcase. We have a lot of great episodes coming up, so I'll see you on down the road. (laughs) 